Ladies and gentlemen, let us pray. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things come to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space. Galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. God of galaxies, how shall we praise thee? For so we must, or wither. Yet what word of words, and where to send it, on which night of winter stars? You are the void where nothing shines. You are the dusky cinder of pure fire in its prime. We consider you in wonder. And say it without voice, praise universes, numberless. Praise all of them. Praise thee. Amen. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of this college, Dr. Axel Steuer. It is my great pleasure to welcome each of you to this, the 33rd Annual Nobel Conference at Gustavus Adolphus College. We are honored to have with us for these next two days an especially distinguished group of speakers and panelists as we together explore the very timely topic of unveiling the solar system. What insights have 30 years of highly sophisticated study of our galactic neighborhood, as conference director Richard Q. Alvey likes to describe our solar system, brought us? And what issues most intrigue the scientific community today 40 years after the epoch-altering launch of the first artificial Earth satellite, Sputnik. The timeliness of this year's Nobel Conference topic is underscored by the almost daily news reports related to new discoveries about our little corner of the universe or about efforts to make such discoveries. So in a sense, we are here together to catch our breath, to take stock, to reflect upon where we have come to reflect upon where all of this exploration of new frontiers might lead. Your presence with us is strong evidence of the fascination with the character of our solar system. Its history, its makeup, and its destiny is as persuasive today and pervasive today as it has ever been. Over the next two days, our horizons will be expanded as we hear stimulating presentations, participate in lively discussions, and enjoy the beautiful music and visual art related to our conference theme. This conference is one of the ways that Gustavus Adolphus College affirms its roots in the high aspirations and values of the Swedish Lutheran immigrants who founded this community of liberal learning more than 135 years ago. Building on this solid foundation, Gustavus Adolphus has evolved into a distinctive institution, a college of character that declares that the unfettered pursuit of truth and the development of values as an integral part of intellectual growth are central to its educational mission. A number of us here have read at least some of the many books and articles written by our celebrated speakers. Our renowned guests will be our teachers for these next two days, and if this Nobel Conference tradition holds, they will have acquired scores, hundreds, even thousands of new friends by tomorrow evening. In the words of an Ivy League college a university president who recently wrote to me about this conference, it promises to be a fantastic meeting of great minds. These annual Nobel conferences are authorized by the Nobel Foundation Stockholm, Sweden, as a memorial to the life and ideals of the great Swedish-born inventor, international businessman, and philanthropist Alfred Nobel. We are grateful for the singular and very special relationship that Gustavus Adolphus College has enjoyed over all these years with the Nobel Foundation and for its official endorsement of these conferences. This has permitted us to convene memorable conversations over the years with, with some of the leading thinkers at the forefront of the various sciences. These conversations underscore the commitment that this college has 
to the lively interchange of ideas across a broad range of disciplines, an exchange informed as it is by ethical and theological reflections, an exchange that well expresses the essence of liberal arts education at Gustavus. As you will see in your programs, this 33rd Nobel Conference is in, in, in particular is dedicated to the memory of two persons who are scheduled to be participants in these proceedings, but who suffered untimely deaths within the past year, Dr. Carl Sagan and Dr. Eugene Shoemaker. They sparked much interest in and cast much light upon the subject of our deliberations, and so we honor them in absentia and say collectively, may their memories long be blessed. In closing, I wish to acknowledge the financial support for these annual Nobel conferences provided through an endowment established by members of the Russell Lund family, three of whom served this college as distinguished trustees for a long time. In turn, the Robert E. and Susan T. Rydell Distinguished Nobel Conference Professorship, established through the generosity of two Gustavus parents, brings to the Gustavus campus as visiting uh, professors persons of extraordinary wisdom and experience. The present Rydell Conference Nobel Conference professor, Dr. Philip Morrison, and his wife Phyllis, he was himself a presenter at the 1991 Nobel Conference, will be joining us for our discussions. Again, on behalf of Gustavus Adolphus College, I welcome each of you to yet another journey of discovery and now declare the 33rd Annual Nobel Conference Unveiling the Solar System, 30 Years of Exploration, officially open. And I now call to the podium our Dean of the Faculty and Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Elizabeth Baer. Elizabeth. Thank you, Axel. Uh, good morning. It is my pleasure to add words of welcome to those that President Stoyer has already brought to you. Uh, and I would like to do so particularly to our podium uh, party and to all the visitors to our campus from around the country and some international visitors. And I'd like to bring those greetings to you on behalf of the faculty and the students at Gustavus Adolphus College. As the President has indicated, we take justifiable pride in the Nobel Conference, which brings together um, speakers and topics of high quality with ethical analysis. Such high quality with attention to values is consonant with all that we do at Gustavus. Other markers of our work together on this campus include our commitment to community, both internal and external, and an appreciation for the enduring human need for beauty, as is evidenced by the music that you heard this morning, and um, I hope you will join us for the concert this evening. Also, as evidenced by the art exhibit of our uh, studio art faculty, which will have its uh, gala opening at 6.30 this evening, and we hope you'll join us for that. Uh, and as uh, demonstrated by the many beautiful sculptures by Paul Granlund, which grace our campus. We hope that your two days with us will allow you to partake of all of these aspects of our community. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Gretchen Hoffmeister, Assistant Professor of Chemistry at Gustavus, who will be reading the citation for the honorary degree. Dr. Hoffmeister came to Gustavus in the fall of 1995. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Carleton College, graduating magna cum laude, and she earned her PhD degree from the University of California at Berkeley in organic and inorganic synthetic chemistry. After completion of the doctorate, she received a postdoc fellowship from the National Institute of Health to work at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in organometallic and polymer chemistry. Prior to joining the faculty at Gustavus, she served as, as an assistant professor of chemistry at Carleton College. She began her career here with a prestigious grant from the Dreyfus Foundation, uh, startup funds to provide her uh, research program uh, with uh, students 
and this was given to her in recognition of her great potential as a scientist. Gretchen has numerous chemistry publications and presentations to her credit. Her current research interests are in macromolecular chemistry and molecular recognition. Please join me in welcoming Gretchen to the podium. Thank you, Elizabeth. President Stoyer, Dean Baer, members and guests of the Gustavus Adolphus community, we are honored to have among our distinguished Nobel Conference speakers, Dr. F. Sherwood Rowland, Donald Bren Research Professor of Chemistry at the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Rowland received his bachelor's degree from Ohio Wesleyan University and his master's and doctoral degrees from the University of Chicago. After holding faculty positions at Princeton University and the University of Kansas, Dr. Rowland came to the University of California, Irvine in 1964 as the first chair of the chemistry department. Professor Rowland's work exemplifies the importance of basic science in addressing problems of humanity. His early investigations into the reactivity of halogen atoms led to studies of the kinetics of chlorinated and fluorinated hydrocarbons. He then became intrigued by the ultimate fate of chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, after they are released into the atmosphere. This resulted in the seminal paper published in 1974 with colleague Mario Molina, which described how CFCs were depleting the Earth's protective ozone layer. Their warning catalyzed scientific efforts to measure and monitor the ozone levels and other components of the stratosphere, and eventually resulted in the Montreal Protocol, the International Agreement for Controlling Environmental Damage to the Global Atmosphere, and terminating the production and use of chlorofluorocarbons. These events have not transpired without a struggle. Professor Rowland has performed a tremendous public service by patiently describing the science of ozone depletion to non-specialists and defending it against critics, and by tirelessly lobbying Congress and other legislative bodies to limit the use of CFCs. He has said that he feels as if he has explained the theory of ozone depletion to the whole world, one person at a time. In this way, he has exhibited his profound dedication not only to the pursuit of scientific truth, but also to the education and well-being of the Earth's current and future citizens. Dr. Rowland was cited in a recent USA Weekend magazine as one of the 10 people who can change your life for his work in policing the ozone. Professor Rowland, I hope the whole world thanks you for it, one person at a time. Frank Sherwood Rowland, your contributions in the fields of atmospheric chemistry, radiochemistry, and chemical kinetics have been both varied and profound. Among other things, you have helped us to understand better the effect that human activity can have on the surrounding atmosphere that nourishes and protects life on Earth. It is perhaps still too rare that distinguished scientists and their discoveries become part of the popular culture but surely, your work on ozone depletion and global warming is as widely talked about over dinner tables across our land as are the exploits of briefly famous athletes or popular music stars. Beginning your career in chemistry at a college much like Gustavus, you've garnered scholarly uh, honors and global recognition throughout your life and career. Beginning with the election to Phi Beta Kappa as an undergraduate, to scores of distinguished awards and prizes, not the least of which is the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1995. My wife and I were proud members of the audience in Stockholm that crisp December afternoon and evening when the world celebrated your many distinguished achievements in chemistry. 
A number of other fine colleges and universities around the world have granted you honorary doctorates, and we will be honored to be counted among them. Today, we gladly, gladly laud your versatile intellect, the breadth of your research interests, and the defense of our environment that your painstaking work has made possible. We now invite you to join the great fellowship of alumni of Gustavus Dolphus College who share your intellectual curiosity and your passion for understanding the character of our physical universe. Therefore, by the authority vested in this institution by the state of Minnesota, and upon the recommendation of the Board of Trustees and the faculty, I hereby confer upon you, F. Sherwood Rowland, the, the, the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges, and honors pertaining thereto. platform party will proceed to their seats and we will proceed to the first lecture immediately. Dr. Stone, if you would come forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the very knowledgeable and efficient chairman of this conference and associate professor of physics and astronomy in the college, Charles Niederreiter. Thank you, Chaplain Elby. It's my pleasure to introduce to you this morning my colleague, Professor Eric Eliason. Dr. Eliason holds a BA degree in math and computer science from Augustana, Rock Island, and a master's and a PhD in English literature from the University of Virginia. He has been a member of our English program since 1989 and is currently an associate professor. Professor Eliason will now introduce our first speaker, Dr. Edward Stone. Good morning. If, like me, most of your information about solar system exploration comes from the popular press, you might be under the impression that the really big names in this enterprise belong to machines and to projects. Discoverer, pioneer, Viking, explorer, Voyager, Magellan, Galileo, Pathfinder, Cassini. For the last 30 years, these are the names which have become associated in my mind with the latest discoveries and the most amazing pictures of the solar system and beyond. Today, however, we have the great privilege of being introduced to and hearing from one of the most important humans behind these famous machines. Dr. Edward Stone is currently director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and vice president and David Morisot professor of physics at Caltech. Among his earliest scientific projects, he paid attention to the world of the very small out in the vast largeness of outer space, studying the nuclei of cosmic rays and looking for atoms of lead and pl platinum. Among his later projects, he has been in charge of the big picture in outer space. He has extensive involvement with the two Voyager spacecraft, which have completed their flybys of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and are this morning out looking for the outer limits of the sun's magnetic field and the outward flow of solar wind. 
As director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Dr. Stone oversees the ambitious scope of NASA's upcoming interplanetary missions. Indeed, when he leaves this conference, he will be heading out for next Monday's launch of the Cassini probe of Saturn and Titan. The extensive list of Dr. Stone's academic and prof professional credentials and awards can be found in your program, but deserving special mention are the National Medal of Science received from President Bush, the American Philosophical Society Magellanic Award, and NASA's Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal. Please welcome Dr. Edward Stone, who will address us on the topic of the search for life elsewhere. Thank you, Eric. I'm certainly very pleased to be here today. This is really a very appropriate time for this conference on the solar system because it was just 40 years ago this month that the uh, Soviet probe Sputnik opened the space age. And the space age, in turn, has opened the solar system to exploration and to the search for life elsewhere. Life elsewhere has been a subject of human interest for many, many years and because we are trying to understand our place in the universe. And it's also, of course, been the subject of countless tales of science fiction. But it's only with the space age that we've been able to take the first scientific steps of trying to understand whether there is life elsewhere than here on Earth. That first step was taken 21 years ago, if I could have the first slide, please, when the uh, uh, Viking spacecraft were sent to Mars. There we go. Mars is a planet which is most like Earth in many ways. Now, it's distinctly different, but most like Earth, and therefore was regarded as a place where one might find evidence of past life or possibly even of present life. Uh, this was 25 years ago when these missions were being planned. Uh, Mars has large volcanoes like Earth. It has this huge canyon system which stretches the width of a, a distance which is equivalent to, to the width of the North American continent. Uh, it's a somewhat smaller planet, but it, and its atmosphere is much, uh, much, less, uh, uh, much more tenuous than the, is the case of the Earth. So there's some very distinctive differences. This, of course, uh, there were two landers which landed on Mars in 1976. Uh, they were instrumented to look for life. And as you can see by these scoop marks in the soil, uh, soil was picked up uh, and analyzed both for the possibility that life was still there and also to look for any evidence uh, in, the, in forms of uh, organic material that life might have been there in the past. As I'm sure all of you know, uh, that search for life was a disappointment because what was discovered was that the surface of Mars is sterile. Uh, there is essentially no ozone to protect the surface from the intense ultraviolet radiation that sterilizes the soil. In addition, there is an oxidizing component in the soil uh, which uh, destroys organic compounds. So the surface of Mars uh, is not the place to look for either extant life or any evidence of past life. Uh, and that disappointment really uh, put a, uh, a damper on further uh, searches for life for a number of years. But it's interesting, at the same time, uh, this first attempt to, scientific attempt to look for life was a disappointment. Uh, there were discoveries here on Earth that were to change our whole idea of, uh, of the conditions under which life could uh, thrive. For instance, here on Earth, uh, in 1977, just one year after the Viking landings on Mars, just off the coast of South America, uh, a life was found near the vents in the floor of the ocean. These tube worms, which you can see, uh, uh, the red tops are essentially where the blood is flowing, circulating the, uh, the nutrients and the energy that basically coming out of the interior of the earth back down into the gut of the worm where there are uh, microbes which then can convert that chemical energy into more complex hydrocarbons. So here is an ecosystem 
which does not depend on photosynthesis and sunlight as the base of the food chain, but depends on chemical energy coming from the interior of the earth. And there's an entire light set of life uh, uh, which has developed around these thermal vents at the base of the ocean. So the, this is life which, in fact, thrives in water which is very near boiling. It wasn't too much later that, in fact, life was also found underneath the ice in Antarctica. This is algae. Uh, here the temperature is just below the freezing point of water, uh, and yet life thrives. So we now, in fact, also find life in rock, which has uh, been drilled two miles deep in the earth. If there's water in the rock, there is life. When that was first discovered, it was believed, because of our narrow concept of life on Earth, that that must have been a contamination. But now it's very clear uh, that life, in fact, is pervasive on Earth. Wherever there is water, there seems to be life. That allowed us to refocus the search for life in the, in the solar system to the search for water in the solar system. And of course, we knew that at one time, Mars had a lot of water on its surface. These huge channels were cut by floods, massive floods of water, uh, several billion years ago. We now believe that uh, Mars, of course, which is as old as the Earth, about four and a half billion years old, uh, for about the first billion years or so, may well have had oceans of water on its surface. Uh, and then for the subsequent several billion years, an occasional flood of water would erupt onto the surface carving these massive channels. That was more than enough time for life to have, uh, have evolved, because here on Earth, life evolved very rapidly uh, after the uh, cessation of the bombardment in the early uh, phases of the solar system. And so it's believed that water was present on Mars for a long enough period of time that life could have evolved. Today, th there is no liquid water on the surface of Mars. Uh, it may well be underground in uh, permafrost, and if it's deep enough, in liquid water. This is a, what looks like a dried lake bed uh, on Mars. Again, evidence that there was standing water at one time on Mars. So we had refocused the Mars program to look for water. And then a year ago, while we were just beginning, uh, just getting ready to launch the first of two new Mars probes, uh, scientists from Johnson Space Center in Stanford reported results of analyzing this rock from Mars, meteorite from Mars. Now we know this, this and about 11 other meteorites that were found in Antarctica are from Mars because the gases which are trapped interior to the rock have the composition of the, of the atmosphere of Mars, which is distinctive. It's different than our atmosphere. It's different than any other atmosphere. So there's little scientific question that this rock was blasted off the surface of Mars uh, about, three, about uh, four billion years ago and circled around the sun uh, in its orbit until about 15 million years ago when it landed in Antarctica on a glacier. And the glacier slowly but surely carried that rock up to the point where it ran into a wall and this ice began to sublime and these meteorites end up on the surface of the glacier quite clearly, quite easily found. There are many thousands of such meteorites, most of which are not from Mars. There are a few from the moon as well. And, about thir and that was about uh, 13,000 years ago that, it, uh, that it, it circulated around in space, arriving uh, in Antarctica 13,000 years ago and was discovered just a few years ago. Inside this rock, what the scientists found were these deposits of carbonate material. Now, carbonates can be deposited chemically, but they can also be deposited uh, by bacteria. So one possibility is that these are the res a result of a bacterial deposition. That was one piece of evidence that was offered. A second piece of evidence was that in the, in the periphery of these deposits, uh, there were small crystals of a material called magnetite. Again, magnetite can be pr produced chemically, but it can also be, here on Earth, produced by bacteria. So a second uh, piece of evidence that possibly there was life uh, at one time. And the third piece of evidence was that in this same region interior in the rock, uh, the, the careful analysis of Stanford showed a, uh, a presence of 
uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are uh, organic compounds which, again, can be produced chemically. In fact, we find these compounds throughout interstellar space, actually. But they can, there can also be the residue of life, that is, the breakdown of more complex organic compounds which are associated with life. So they said there are three pieces of evidence, all found in the same place. Yes, indeed, you can explain each of them by other than life, but since they're all together in one place, their suggestion was the presence of life is the easiest uh, explanation. So it is, in a sense, circumstantial evidence. They had one more piece of evidence that they offered, and that was in this uh, electron micrograph, these small little structures, which look a little bit like uh, primitive uh, fossils, except these are about 100 times smaller than the smallest fossils that have been found on Earth. And there are many scientists who believe that these particular uh, features are just too small to have been uh, a living organism. There just isn't enough space, enough volume in them to contain the complex molecules uh, which are fundamental to life. So this is a very controversial suggestion. In fact, the entire uh, question of whether or not this evidence is evidence, con concrete evidence for life, I would say the verdict is it's not concrete evidence at all. Many scientists now applying their own techniques to analyze the nature of these, uh, of these uh, deposits in this rock to see if they can either rule out life, for instance, if they could show the temperature at which all of this happened was much too high, or conceivably, although perhaps even more difficult, to actually establish that uh, these were produced by life. It's unlikely this one rock is in any way going to uh, be a definitive statement with respect to life elsewhere. But it, it is still, it is not inconsistent with, the, I think, the general feeling in the science community that there was life on Mars at one time. The challenge we have is finding evidence for that life. And so we're on our way back to Mars. And the mission which we launched last December uh, is Mars Pathfinder. Uh, you can see it here in the laboratory with its small rover Sojourner, which is tucked up inside. You can see in its crouched position so it will fit inside this tetrahedron. Uh, and the lander station, which today is called the Sagan Memorial Station, uh, carried uh, the Sojourner to Mars. Now, we picked a spot, since I said water is a key, we picked a spot. This is a huge flood channel, tens of miles wide, which has been carved by a flood of water flowing this way into this large basin. And we picked a spot as indicated by this ellipse, which is about 60 by 120 miles in size, uh, far enough from the mouth so that the big boulders that the water carried would be dropped and hopefully only the smaller boulders would have been carried out to this distance so that they would be of a size that the little rover could navigate. Uh, the advantage of picking this grab by bag site is that nature has provided us a, a, a sample of rocks from a great region on Mars because the water has carried rocks from uh, diverse regions down to this one location. So even though we can't move very far, we hopefully can sample a much larger region on Mars. The challenge was doing all this at much lower cost than, in fact, uh, that, that was the uh, situation for the Viking mission uh, 20 years ago. In fact, the cost of this mission was between 5 and 10 percent of the cost of Viking. If I could have the video now, this is a, a computer graphic of the, of the innovative way that was uh, chosen if I could have the uh, uh, video, please, uh, that was chosen to, uh, to deliver uh, Sojourner to the surface of Mars directly from launch from Earth. And as you can see in this image, uh, we went directly to Mars, entered the atmosphere with an aeroshell, slowed us down just like the shuttle slows down as it returns to Earth uh, when it lands, uh, using just the air as an aero brake, uh, taking out most of the velocity uh, as, the, uh, as the probe comes in. We then pop a parachute, as you can see. Uh, once we slow down enough, uh, pop a parachute, and that will then uh, take out more of the velocity of the landing system. All of this is done on a direct launch from Earth. We did not go into orbit first. As the uh, spacecraft drops, it, we will eject the, uh, the, cone, the uh, aeroshell. Uh, we don't need it anymore, and uh, Pathfinder is tucked up inside. In a moment, we'll see it tethered out on a long tether so that we separate it from the uh, balloon system. 
uh, so that when we cut it loose, the balloon doesn't fall on top of it. That would be a rather unfortunate happening if that were to have happened. Uh, so we have, a, have the, uh, there's the tether coming out right now. And in a moment, uh, you'll see the uh, a set of airbags pop up, uh, inflate around, around the uh, sojourner. Here's the tetrahedron and a set of airbags about 20 feet across and then some retro rockets fire to bring it to a stop and we cut it loose and drop it from an altitude of about 50 feet. And it bounces. This computer graphic was actually uh, developed by students at Georgia Tech. It's a beautiful computer graphic. Uh, obviously, we did not have cameras taking any pictures of this event. The cameras were still inside the airbags. Uh, and uh, it turns out it, it bounced at least 16 times. The first bounce was about 50 feet high. Uh, it did land. There are four sides. Uh, this computer graphic shows how the system uh, would have deployed had it landed on other than the bottom side. We actually lucked out one out of four. We landed on the bottom side. The airbags were deflated and retracted with some small motors. And then, uh, in this case, you'll see it will flip first onto its base. Pathfinder didn't have to do that since it was already on its base. And then the four, the th other three pedals uh, with solar panels on them and with, uh, with Sojourner uh, on it, uh, open, uh, ready for exploration. That's it for the video. Thank you. So that was all on the 4th of July. You can imagine there were a lot of happy people when this image came back. There was Sojourner still in its crouched position. There are the airbags. Uh, we had to, in fact, lift this panel up again and pull some more on that airbag to get it out of the way because we have two ramps uh, which unroll so that Sojourner can drive down onto the surface of Mars. There's, uh, there's the Sojourner. It's about two feet long, about one foot high. It's powered by solar panels. Uh, the peak power at high noon is 16 watts. The night light that many of you have at home is about twice that. So the average power of this little rover is about like your night light. And it has to do everything, drive itself, compute, uh, navigate, and uh, uh, communicate back to the lander. This uh, s small rock was the first rock we visited. It's called Barnacle Bill. You can see it's it's, uh, it's quite rounded. That's exactly what you expect from rocks which were carried by this flood of water. They're tumbled and rounded. So these are the kinds of rocks, and they're the size that we expected at this distance from the mouth of this huge channel. So this is one kind of rocky material uh, which we found. That is rocky material which came from somewhere else uh, on Mars at higher, uh, higher altitudes. Another kind of uh, rock that we've investigated is uh, this, these white patches, which you see here. And I'll show you in a moment a video, uh, uh, a video of uh, examination of this particular kind of rocky material. It uh, turns out that material it look, appears to be just compacted dust, but it's compact and, and consolidated, so it's very, very hard. So that's the second kind of rock. And a third kind of rock is illustrated by this particular f area, which is called the rock garden. Notice the flat, angular shape of these rocks. This is called flat top. That one's called wedge. These were clearly not tumbled and carried by the, by the flood. Uh, these were probably ejected from a nearby impact crater. And so this material comes from nearby rather than from great distances. It's covered, as you can see, by this ubiquitous red dust, which has a consistency not of sand but of silt or of talcum, a very, very fine material which can be lofted and into great dust storms on Mars and coats the surface of uh, everything. So if I can now have uh, the video again, please. Uh, this is a small set of uh, time-lapse uh, images of the rover. Here it comes down the ramp. These are the, as you can see, the ramp moving as the rover is coming down. Uh, we obviously do not see this in real time. Uh, and you'll notice the rover isn't always in the center of the image. That's because we have to point the camera, take the picture where we think the rover is going to be, take the picture and look later to see if it all worked out. You can, you can see now uh, some of the capability of this particular uh, system. Uh, that was not intended. The rover, the rover didn't get it right that time. 
uh, but uh, it did get it right later. There's a small alpha proton X-ray spectrometer which uh, it radiates the rock with alpha particles, and that allows us to analyze what the rock is made of. And w the first rock we looked at, Barnacle Bill, we were surprised. We did not expect to find rocks which were silicate rich. Those are characteristics of rocks here on Earth because of all the recycling that's gone on uh, with continental drift and plate tectonics. We believe that the geology on Mars was much simpler. And in fact, the first rock we looked at said, wrong, Mars has had a complicated geological past as well. Uh, now we'll see the rover coming over to the uh, white area, putting its alpha proton X-ray spectrometer down to analyze the composition. And now you see we use the wheels on the rover to uh, uh, mechanically abrade the white area to see if it's just a crust or if it's really a consolidated rock. The result of this experiment was we did no damage at all to that white material. It's very, very hard. Uh, and we believe this white material may underlie this entire region that it's the, if you like, it's, uh, it's a, it's a uh, sedimentary uh, material that was left by the flood of water. Now you'll see the rover, again, uh, uh, moving across the surface. You'll have some images of, uh, here you can see the rover doing a wheelie because we use the wheels to dig holes in the sand and the soil. Again, here you can see one of those uh, holes that was dug to, in order to determine the mechanical properties of the soil. You can see the flexibility of this little tiny 25-pound rover uh, has remarkable agility uh, on this surface, can uh, go over rocks as large as the wheels themselves, which is uh, a special attribute of this particular system. You'll see, I think, uh, in one of the uh, sequences coming up in a moment, uh, the uh, fair amount of motion of the uh, rocker bogey uh, in, as the rover, all by itself, decides how to navigate the surface. You can see a uh, extreme case of it here, going over a rock, which is quite large, actually. So we just tell the rover, we want to go here. The rover has enough smarts to know that it could go over this rock, and if it was a large rock, it would go around it. If we want to look under a rock, we can also do that. Uh, as you'll see in this image right here, we can actually move it and look underneath. So even though this is a rather primitive rover compared to what we hope to eventually put on Mars in 2001, it already demonstrated uh, the capability to, to, uh, to analyze the composition of rocks such as Yogi. This is another uh, silicate-rich rock, uh, this, uh, which is rounded, so it's a rock which has been carried here. This is now a 360-degree pan. Uh, this is that white uh, rocky material I showed you in one of the slides in which uh, the rover analyzed. Uh, we found its composition is more like what we expected. The dust is, in fact, the kind of non-silicate-rich material that we expected was characteristic of Mars. Uh, but as I said, several of the rocks are quite distinctly different. Uh, we are in a small ravine, which was carved by this flood of water uh, some time ago. Uh, and uh, at, because it was basically a ball, it bounced down to the lowest spot. And uh, this is a, uh, there are a series of ridges which don't show up, but in uh, three-dimensional stereo images, you can see that there are a series of ridges and we will be sending the little rover up to uh, one of the ridges to look over uh, and down into the next ravine. But we won't send it there because it has to be able to communicate back uh, to the lander. And uh, so we're, we're not likely to send it out of sight, uh, at, least in, uh, at least not until we're sure we're essentially at the end of the mission. Here you can see the, the ramps which were rolled down. These are two peaks off in the distance. And now we're back to uh, where we started. All right, that's it for the video, thank you. So, we have found a way to uh, uh, have maneuverability on the surface of Mars, and even though this little rover did not have the capability to search for life itself, it get demonstrated that we can, in fact, in a much a lower cost way, get to the surface of Mars uh, and, uh, and begin the exploration uh, that will lead us, I think, to uh, uh, looking for life on Mars. The next step. Oh, one last thing I want to mention with the lander has, in addition, uh, a weather station. These are l small little conical wind socks, which we image to see how hard the wind is blowing. When the wind blows hard, they tend to be more horizontal. In addition, there's some hot wires called the hot wire anemometer, 
which uh, depending on how high the wind velocity is, the wire is hotter or colder. And then we actually can measure temperatures uh, with uh, those hot uh, temperature as well as wind velocity. Uh, this landed at, toward the end of the summer at, in Mars. Uh, the daytime temperature was 10 degrees Fahrenheit. The nighttime temperature was 100 degrees below Fahrenheit, cold even for Minnesota. And that will be the life-limiting factor for this rover and the lander, this extreme temperature variation, which goes on every 24 hours uh, during the Martian day. Uh, the, uh, the next step uh, was launched actually one month earlier than Mars Pathfinder. It was on a slower trajectory and just arrived on September 11th. This is the Mars Global Surveyor, which will go into orbit around Mars. Uh, allowing us to, uh, uh, to map very accurately uh, the surface of Mars. In fact, uh, as I said, we just went into orbit uh, less than a month ago. Uh, the magnetometer, which measures the magnetic field, has already discovered that Mars does not have a global magnetic field like the Earth, where essentially there's a bar magnet inside the Earth, and all the compasses all point basically to the North Pole, up near our North rotation axis. Uh, on Mars, it appears as though there are many small bar magnets distributed over its surface. And so a compass is a basically of no use at all in terms of, of locating yourself uh, with respect to the rotation axis of Mars. This is probably a field that was frozen in the rock as it, uh, as it solidified when that volcanic uh, lava was first placed on the surface. There was a magnetic field, global field at that time, presumably. As it freezes, it preserves the direction of the field at the time that it freezes. So as we map out this complex set of magnets on the surface of Mars, we may be able to understand the sequence of events which shaped the surface of Mars. We're just, of course, beginning to anticipate that now that we've uh, discovered uh, these magnetic anomalies, as they're called. We also uh, took some of the uh, first images uh, if I can get there, thank you. Uh, of, uh, of this is not this is a Viking image of a canyon, and this small white uh, 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 trapezoid is the region which was taken. Uh, these images are not of the same qualities we'll get when we're in our final orbit, but they're already quite striking, as you'll see when I show you what the floor of this canyon looks like. You can see things perhaps 30 feet across in this image. You can already see a set of sand dunes on the floor of the canyon, which are presumably moving along the canyon, just as sand dunes that move across our desert. You can also see different kinds of craters. You can see a fresh crater, which has a deep uh, interior, and an older crater, which is filled. We can also begin to see what looks like surface lineaments of some sort here, although the images here are not quite adequate yet, which if, in fact, uh, future images may well be able to tell us if there was a lot of water running on the surface of Mars, which may have contributed to the formation of this canyon, uh, because uh, there is a debate as to exactly how these canyons are formed, whether they're formed from water running on the surface or they're formed by water coming from below the surface, much as artesian water comes from the interior of the Earth. The, uh, another region we looked at is this, uh, this is a Viking image again, the small Inset is the region which was uh, observed uh, by Mars Pathfinder within the last several weeks. Uh, this is a region near the, that Grand Canyon, the Valles Marineris, that I uh, pointed out. At one end of it, it's a kind of a labyrinth area. And in, the, in this image, you can see now the rock outcroppings along the, uh, along the top of the cliff. It's about a 5,000-foot cliff on this, uh, on this uh, uh, on this particular image, you can see the shadow. The sun is very low in the sky. This is the shadow of this particular region. Uh, we can also see some sand dunes and see this, the uh, debris which has uh, tumbled down uh, the slopes. Once we get into orbit next March and we begin our routine mapping of Mars, we will have images. Uh, this is the, you can see things as small as about 30 feet in these images. We will have the capability of seeing things as small as five feet across on the surface of Mars from orbit. Now, we can't map the entire planet at that resolution, uh, but we can map the most interesting areas. And what are the most interesting areas? Well, as I said, we're looking for where there was water. 
we'd like to find, in a certain sense, where the Yellowstone National Parks were on Mars, the thermal hotspots where volcanic activity brought water and nutrients up to the surface, because those are the spots where life could have flourished and where we might, even today, be able to find some evidence of that life. So we have not only the camera, we have another instrument which is very sensitive to looking for carbonates, that is, the materials which are deposited by water as it evaporates, uh, so that we'll be looking for regions where there is an unusual carbonate deposit. And those will be the sites we will pick and choose uh, to go back to with our future landers. Next mission in the sequence will be going to the South Pole of Mars. This is the South Polar Cap at southern summer, so this is when the polar cap is small. It's not water ice, it's solid carbon dioxide, dry ice. Temperature is 200 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Uh, during the southern winter, by the way, the polar cap becomes this large. It gets up to within 40 degrees of the equator. We will land there in November of 99 at about 80 degrees south latitude in the region which goes through these annual cycles uh, on, uh, of, uh, of polar cap and no polar cap. And what we'll be landing is not a rover, but a stationary lander, uh, which, will, uh, which will have an arm on it, which will, which will allow us to dig down into the soil uh, and to bring the soil into an instrument which will heat the soil, drive out the volatiles, such as water, to find out if indeed there was water ice in that soil, or any organic materials which might have been underneath the soil. Remember, the surface of the soil is unlikely to be very interesting, so we need to dig down into the soil. Uh, that will be accompanied by another orbiter, which will have another set of instruments on it, which will allow us to better define where the most interesting spots are on Mars. The, the program for Mars, then, is every 26 months, there is an orbital opportunity. That is, the Earth and Mars are lined up so that we can make the journey from Mars to Earth, every 26 months. And every 26 months, we plan to send an orbiter and a lander. And in 2001, we'll be sending a more competent lander, a rover which can free rove. It will no longer have to stay near the lander system at all. It will communicate directly with the orbiting spacecraft, we, so we can send it off many miles on its journey, uh, hopefully for an extended period of time. And it will have the capability to, to identify the rocks we think are most likely to have been uh, there when there was water and where life might be, have been present in that rocky material, and will cache those rocks in a small pile. In 2003, we'll send another rover to another spot uh, and another orbiter. Uh, it will, uh, this rover will also pick up rocks in a dip from a different region on Mars and cache those. And then in 2005, uh, we will hopefully send a mission to land at one of those two spots, pick up those rocks, and bring them back to Earth where we can analyze them much as the meteorite was analyzed. And how, depending on how smart we were, uh, we may or may not have picked the most interesting rocks. So that's the general strategy which we're pursuing uh, with the Mars program over the next uh, 10 years or so. So about 11 years from now, 1990, in 2008, uh, we would hope to have our first rocks back from some of the most interesting spots on Mars that we can find by looking with our orbiters. Well, Mars is a wonderful place to look for life because it had water at one time. It's not the only place, though, as it turns out. This is Jupiter the giant planet Jupiter. Of course, the great red spot is quite recognizable. And again, let me remind you the size of this giant planet. The great red spot, which is a huge hurricane-like storm system, is three Earths across. So these are giant planets. But I'm not going to talk about Jupiter. It's mainly gas and liquid, not, uh, not, hot, not, a, not a planet where we expect life to have evolved. But there are two moons that are in this image. Io, which is the moon which has eight or ten active volcanoes on it, the most volcanically active object in the solar system, heated by uh, flexing in Jupiter's immense gravity. And somewhat further out, Europa, which is covered with water ice. And it's Europa that is attracting a lot of interest. This is a Voyager image from 1979. If you were to look at this by eye, it would look blindingly snow white. But there are these very faint 
uh, markings which we can stretch and enhance so that you can see these linear-like features in this brownish, what looks like brownish, but in fact is really just slightly less whitish uh, surface area. We knew that this is the smoothest surface in the solar system that we found. There are no mountains, no valleys, essentially no impact craters of any significance at all. Uh, the highest things we found, and now this is a Galileo image. Galileo arrived at Jupiter in December of 95, can fly 100 times closer to these moons than Voyager did, and therefore can reveal much more detail. This is a Voyager image, uh, a Galileo image, and perhaps you can see that, that these, again, this is false color. This would be snow white, but these brownish colorations are deposits on the surface which possibly are associated with the cracks which formed in this ice and with the narrow white ridges which are then formed in the center of these darker regions. These ridges are a few hundred feet high. They're the highest thing on the surface, suggesting that we may be looking at ice pack on a liquid water ocean. Imagine the possibility that there is still an ocean somewhere else in the solar system. Well, Galileo flies much closer. This is an image, if it could be focused just a little, there we go, where you can see in more detail these uh, ridge systems uh, which have formed, and you can see evidence of older ridge systems and still older ones. This surface has been cracked and crazed, uh, and as time goes on, the older cracks uh, essentially subside back into the icy surface, and the fresh ones you can see quite clearly. But the interesting point, thing I want to point out is this chaotic region up here. Uh, which uh, is distinctly different as shown in this image, where you can see the same cracked, uh, crazed features, but notice that these pieces seem to be like pieces of a puzzle which have been torn apart. Uh, certainly suggestive that these were all part of a continuous surface, that they broke off like icebergs and drifted away on a liquid water surface, or at least they were moved away with some motion of, the, of a soft, icy surface. Uh, today, this is a region that's frozen solid. We can tell by these, uh, these, uh, these flows or bergs are typically four miles across, uh, and the shadows tell us how high they are above the, the surrounding terrain, and that allows us to tell how thick they were at the time they were moving around, and on the order of a mile thick. This is how thick the ice crust was at the time these pieces were moving around. Well, Galileo, because of the intense interest in the, in the possibility of finding another ocean, because we know here on Earth it was in the oceans that life began, if there is another ocean still extant in the solar system, it's got to be a subject of great interest in terms of searching for life elsewhere. So we have, we have decided to extend the mission of Galileo through 1998 and 1999. It's in orbit around Jupiter, and every two months it comes back in near one of the moons. And we're going to have it fly by Europa every single time so that we can look to see if there is any better evidence and any other further clues we can glean from these close flybys. But ultimately, what we need to do is to put a spacecraft in orbit around Europa itself, a spacecraft that can measure how thick the ice is so we can find where the thin spots are and look perhaps to where there is currently eruptive activity. Because if we ever want to go down and below that surface, we need to find those spots where it's most, where, where access to that ocean will be uh, most easy. So again, Europa, I believe, will be a very important part of the future search for life in the solar system, but one which we'll continue to develop even over the next two years as Galileo continues its extended mission. Still further out in the solar system is Saturn. It's 10 times as far from the sun as, uh, as the Earth is. Uh, it has its beautiful ring systems, it has some icy moons, but the moon which is most interesting in terms of trying to understand the conditions which may have existed on Earth before life began is the moon Titan. This is a moon as large as the planet Mercury, but because it's in orbit around a planet, it's a moon, not a planet. Unlike Mercury or any other moon for that matter, this moon has a substantial atmosphere. The surface pressure on Titan is 60% greater than here on Earth. And like on Earth, this atmosphere is 80% nitrogen. But unlike Earth, there's essentially no oxygen. Oxygen on Earth was, in fact, generated by primitive life. No oxygen in this atmosphere to speak of, but methane, natural gas. 
Here on Earth, the action of sunlight is to create ozone and no uh, nitrogen oxides. These are the components of smog. In Titan, there are no oxides created by action of sunlight. Rather, the sunlight creates complex organic compounds. Some of them become polymerized to the extent that they form a haze layer, which is so thick you cannot see through it. What you're seeing in this image is an optically thick layer of organic polymers in the atmosphere. Uh, Dave Stevens, who you'll hear about here from tomorrow, and a student of his several years ago, pointed out that, in fact, not only are these polymers there, but one of the simple compounds that's made by this photochemistry is ethane. And at the temperatures and pressures on the surface of Titan, ethane will be liquid. And there could well be lakes of liquid organic compounds on the surface of this bizarre world. Now, this is the Cassini spacecraft. It's now in Florida, ready for launch uh, one, uh, next, uh, early next Monday morning. Uh, it's a joint mission with the European Space Agency and the Italian Space Agency. The Italian Space Agency has provided the radio system. We will use that as a radar system, which will allow us to map the surface of Titan with radar, just as we did at Venus, so that we can determine whether indeed there are lakes of liquid hydrocarbon on its surface and where they are. And the European uh, probe, European Space Agency probe Huygens, which will drop into the atmosphere of Titan with a set of instruments designed to measure the organic materials that are being made there today by sunlight and particle radiation. It's believed that the chemistry which is occurring there today on Titan may resemble in some important ways the chemistry that occurred in the Earth's atmosphere before life evolved. This is nature's laboratory. Uh, just as here on Earth, annual snowfalls accumulate in our polar regions, in our polar caps, in the case of Titan, the solid materials, the solid organic materials, will deposit on the surface layer upon layer, a record, if you like, of the organic chemistry which has occurred in Titan's atmosphere. This probe arrives there in 2004. It's, I think, of what, was, what we're likely to discover will be sufficiently uh, interesting and exciting that we're going to want to go back to Titan, down to its surface. This is not a surface rover. It will just drop to the surface. We will see what the surface looks like, but it's not intended to really work on the surface. It's an atmospheric probe. We will want to go back and explore and learn what Titan has to teach us about the, the origin of life in the solar system. One other important uh, element of the story may well be comets. This is uh, the uh, uh, comet Halley, as it appeared in 1986 when the European Giotto spacecraft flew by. Uh, about that time, we began to realize that comets, which are mainly water ice and rock, are not white. They're charcoal black. They're covered with a black material, carbon-based material of some sort. When the Giotto spacecraft flew through, uh, it had an instrument on it which allowed it to measure uh, the composition of the dust that was coming off. Although it couldn't measure the molecular composition, it could measure the atomic composition. It found that the dust particles were made primarily of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, the atoms which make up organic molecules. We don't know what that organic material is. We don't know where it came from. We see a lot of organic material in interstellar space out of which new solar systems form. So maybe this material was brought into the mix out of which all of everything in the solar system form. We don't know. What we need to do, of course, is to get a sample of that material back to Earth. How do we do that? We're going to be launching a mission called Stardust, which Don, Don Brownlee at uh, Washington University is a principal investigator for, which will fly through uh, the uh, uh, coma of a comet and collect dust. The challenge we have is when we fly through, we're going to fly through at something like 12 or 14,000 miles per hour. And if you try to collect these tiny little dust particles at that velocity, they evaporate. So how do you do it? You do it by capturing them in something called aerogel. This is a silicate material, but its density, as you can tell from this image, is rather low. In fact, we can make this material with a density of air. 
It's made of silicate, but it's the density of air. That material has so, such a low density that these small particles can be captured, slowed down, and stopped in this material without, uh, ev without uh, evaporating them. And the Stardust mission will have panels of this material, which will be held out, if you like, as we go through the comet uh, material, and then tucked back down into this aeroshell, which will then return the material to Earth to Utah in 2006. So in less than 10 years, we should have a sample of this organic material back on Earth for analysis. We know that the comets bombarded Earth early in its formation. The question is, to what extent did the organic material carried by the comets contribute to the organic material in our oceans that were there before life evolved? This will be a major step in understanding the role that comets may have had in the origin of life here on Earth and possibly elsewhere in the solar system. Let me stretch your horizon just a bit farther than the solar system. Uh, this is the Eagle Nebula, about 7,000 light years away. A light year is 6 trillion miles. So uh, this is relatively close astronomically, but much too far to go to. Uh, this, but these are clouds of dust out of which stars form. These are the stellar nurseries uh, where new stars and new planetary systems form. Uh, let me show you, this is a visible, visible light image taken by Hubble for scale. This particular cloud is about, six, about a light year tall, huge region. Uh, let me show you what, uh, that's a visible light image. Here it is again, you can see this, these towers. This is the same area in infrared. You can see through the dust, you can see the stars forming. And we will be launching in the year 2001 an infrared observatory, one purpose of which will be to search for these star-forming regions. And if you find star-forming regions, as you'll hear this afternoon from Alan Boss, we're likely to find planetary systems. In fact, this afternoon you'll hear about some of the initial discoveries about other solar systems. And of course, that opens the possibility of searching for life, not just in our solar system, but in other solar systems. But it, and in fact, here is a Hubble image of uh, one of a star which has an orbiting object around it. Uh, this is a particularly large one. It's got more than 20 times the mass of Jupiter, and it orbits rather far away from the star. So this may not be the best example of a planet, but you'll hear more about that this afternoon. But while we're beginning to develop our technology to look at other solar systems, we already have the technology to extend our search for life beyond Earth uh, uh, and to look for uh, life uh, in our solar system and to look for ex other places in the solar system that can tell us what it might have been like here on Earth before life evolved, all of which is obviously sort of addressing the big question that humanity has had for many years, and that is, how did this all happen on Earth? What is there about Earth that has led to life as we know it here today? Thank you very much. Uh, members of the audience, if you have a question for Dr. Stone, perhaps in behalf of the audience, uh, the ushers will raise your hand, the ushers will have blank cards, and you can write the question out and hand it back to the usher. 
Yasha will bring it up here. While the audience is thinking about questions and writing them down, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our distinguished panel. From your right to the left, F. Sherwood Rowland, Donald Bren, Research Professor of Chemistry at the University of California, Irvine, and winner of the 1995 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. David Stevenson, Professor of Planetary Science, California Institute of Technology. Story Musgrave, NASA astronaut, Johnson Space Flight Center, recently retired. Roald Zogdev, Distinguished Professor of Physics, University of Maryland, and former Director of Moscow's Institute for Space Research. Edward Stone, Director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Alan Boss, Division of Terrestrial Magnetism at the Carnegie Institution of Washington. Robert John Russell, who will join us this afternoon, is the Director of the Center for Theology and the Natural Science in Berkeley and Philip Morrison, Institute Professor Emeritus from MIT, and this year's Rydell Professor at Gustavus. <laughs> I'd like to begin by asking the panel for responses. Um, perhaps we can begin with um, Dr. Boss. Yeah, I think uh, from hearing Ed Stone's talk, everyone realizes that NASA has had a banner year, and particularly the, uh, the Mars uh, lander has really been spectacular. And I believe that actually Vice President Gore was given a uh, picture of the Mars panorama and put it in his office, about a 20-foot long panorama, and insisted that all the visitors to his office put on the cellophane glasses and uh, take a guided tour of the surface of Mars to the Vice President. So I think it's really a great measure of administration support for the, uh, for the program to see that sort of thing happen. The question I... We're checking out the fire alarm at this time. We'll let you know shortly. You think people should leave? <laughs> uh, be be calm, people. Just getting everybody out. <laughs> I'm I'm, back again. Here, that is a fire alarm, but let's wait for just a moment. Okay, apparently there's no fire. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> the question I have for you regards NASA's plans about returning to Europa. You pointed out that with the uh, uh, Cassini mission, that we'll certainly be tantalized by what we learned at Titan. We're, we have definite plans to continue going back to Mars. Uh, what is NASA going to be able to do to get below the ice of Europa? Are there any hopes that NASA will perhaps send something which could uh, penetrate the ice and bring up a sample from down below? Uh, yes, there is. And, uh, uh, we, in fact, are talking with the National Science Foundation. It turns out there is a lake in Antarctica called Lake Vostok, uh, which uh, is about two miles down below the ice. It's about the size of one of the Great Lakes. Uh, it has not yet been penetrated because uh, it's, it's been sealed off for uh, uh, perhaps a million years or so. Uh, and that, so there is a great interest in developing the technology to be able to explore that lake. And that may be a, a, a joint capability where uh, we can learn how to do such things here on Earth uh, before we deploy uh, such a system on uh, Europa. But we're beginning to study it. 
But we'll have enough time because I think the first mission to Europa will be the mapping mission. That will give us enough time to develop the technology and test it so that we can uh, probe down into the, uh, through the ice if we can find a thin, thin enough spot. Other questions from the panel? Yeah, Phil. Phil. I have a very simple, rather immediate question, not touching the large issues, but I think it's interesting. When will we hear the winds of Mars? When will we hear the winds of Mars? Why not? Well, we, we have, actually, that's a, we, we could make a, a sound recording of the data we have, and perhaps that's something we should do. But we have been recording the winds on Mars. We did one 24-hour high-resolution a re record of the winds on Mars, and we found it's, it's, uh, there are small little dust devils, and we've actually seen a dust devil move past the landing spacecraft. Uh, and it's a, uh, of course, the atmosphere is much more tenuous than here on Earth, less than 1% of the Earth's pressure. What about a microphone? Uh, I might, well, in a certain sense, I, uh, yes, uh, that's, good, that's good, uh, good suggestion. I don't know if we have a plan for a microphone or not, but uh, that's a very good suggestion. Uh, it's really cheap. Yes. <laughs> Professor Rowland. Ed, you, you mentioned that the uh, gases in the meteorite from the Allen Hills yeah. and the gases in Mars yeah. have the same composition. Yeah. Uh, how detailed is the correspondence for that? Do you have isotopic? Yes, there's isotopic composition. As I recall, it's oxygen 18 is one of the key signatures of, uh, of, the, of the Martian gas. So there's both elemental and isotopic information which is consistent with with, uh, with Mars atmosphere. How many species do, were they uh, able to I, measure? You know, I, don't, I really don't remember. It's uh, several, but I don't remember. Well, we have a question from the audience. What evidence suggests that the features on Mars are carved by liquid water rather than some other liquid? Why don't we let David Stevenson answer that question? <laughs> The features that have been attributed to the flow of water on Mars can be analyzed by fluid dynamical techniques. If you go into the lab and carry out experiments on flow of liquids, you can learn about the particular shapes, forms that are created as a function of the flow. For example, how it depends on the viscosity of the fluid. In this particular instance, it does seem as though you need a very vigorous flow uh, in the language of fluid dynamicists, high Reynolds number. It could, of course, be something other than just pure water. It could be water and ice, water and mud. It could be a rather complicated fluid, but as best we can figure it out, you cannot create these features with, for example, a lava flow, which would be the most obvious alternative. A, a lava flow does not produce the particular shapes and forms that we see in these channels. You also do not see the aggregation of rocks that would result from such a lava flow. There is no other liquid that one can think of. Carbon dioxide, for example, will not flow as a liquid on the surface of Mars. So by this fluid dynamical argument and a process of elimination, it seems quite clear that water is involved. Another question from the audience. Do we currently know enough about what life consists of to efficiently look for it elsewhere? <laughs> well, that's a very, uh, very interesting question because in a certain sense, if we should find evidence for life on Mars, one of the most important things to do would be to try to understand the similarity or dissimilarity of the basic genetic uh, makeup of that life, because either answer would be of fundamental importance, either that it shares a genetic uh, DNA uh, origin with life here on Earth, or that it does not. Either would really be a very important uh, answer from a biological point of view. Thank you. Uh, I think this is for um, Dr. Stone. What is your opinion on the so-called face on Mars, a rock formation that has been publicized by different groups as a model of civilization of a civilization structure of some sort. Well, I believe the face on Mars is a result of a particular lighting condition which, uh, which gave the shadows that look like the face. There's a famous rock uh, along the freeway in Pasadena called Eagle Rock, which when you drive by it at the right time of day, it looks like an eagle in flight. 
I certainly know, though, that it was not an eagle, nor was it carved by any intelligent being. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what do you see as the significance of finding life elsewhere? What will it mean for us to know that we're not alone? Well, that's a very deep question, uh, certainly. Uh, it's hard to judge what the impact will be on human thought once, if, and when we finally do uh, find life elsewhere. Uh, it will be a further evolution of the general trend of, of recognizing that, first of all, the Earth was not the center of the universe, uh, and the galaxy is, our galaxy is not the center of the universe. So it's, a, it's in a certain sense helping us understand our place in the universe. But the impact of that, I think, is something you can't judge until the event happens, if and when it happens. Thank you. We have a number of questions about uh, the plutonium uh, that's carried on Cassini. Uh, one of these I'll, I'll read is, can you clarify the questions about the plutonium content of Cassini and the threat, if any, that it may pose? There is, uh, there is plutonium, but the way we power spacecraft in the outer solar system with Saturn, the sunlight is less than, on the order of 1% of what it is here at Earth, so the size of solar panels that would be needed would be the size of tennis courts and are just not feasible. Uh, and all the spacecraft we've flown to the outer solar system, two Pioneers and the two Voyagers and Galileo and now Cassini, are powered by plutonium heat sources. It's, it's a material which is uh, 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 heat source. It's not a. It's not a reactor. It's not a fusion source, or a fission source. It's just a decay of plutonium 238. The material is uh, hazardous in the sense that uh, you have to take very special precautions. So what has been done is it's been put in a form which is ceramic, uh, so that if there should be an accident, uh, the material will not be dispersed over large areas at all. Uh, and will remain in fairly large chunks and therefore not breathable, which is the main way that plutonium would be a hazard. So uh, I think that the, uh, the, certainly the feeling that all the, all the people who worked on the tests, and many tests have been done to confirm that this it's clad in material which can take 4,500 degrees temperature. It's then put inside a graphite blocks, which can help it re-enter the atmosphere. These, these iridium-clad ceramics have been fired into uh, uh, concrete walls. Uh, they have been subjected to uh, rocket uh, exhaust heat uh, in order to really demonstrate, not just calculate, but to demonstrate that there is really no practical risk associated with launching this plutonium. In fact, we've had Apollo 13 re-entered, as you know, the, land, land, the lunar lander re-entered when it brought the astronauts back from that uh, journey, and that had an RTGs on it which re-entered uh, and deposit in the ocean, there's absolutely no sign that any of that plutonium was ever dispersed. Okay, thank you. We will take a break now for lunch and reconvene at 1.15 for music and 1.30 for our next speaker. Thank you.